telephone conversation between a receptionist who works at a house renting agency and a man. First, you'll have some time to look at questions one to four. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hello, how can I help you today? Ah yes, hello. I'm just phoning you as I have seen an advertisement on your website for a property that I'm interested in renting. If possible, I'd like to find out some more information before I organise a viewing. No problem at all. What is the address of the property that you'd like to inquire about? It's 21 North Avenue. OK, what is it that you'd like to know? First of all, I'd like to know what facilities the office has, as I need to make sure that it'll be suitable for my advertising company. I see. The office contains a large open plan space with a wide frontage onto a busy street with lots of passers-by, so your business would have a really good street presence. There is also a toilet and newly refurbished kitchen equipped with a dishwasher and oven. Wow, that sounds great. I'd definitely like to register my interest. OK, perfect. I just need to take some details from you, if that's OK. What is your full name? Jonathan Smith. And what position do you hold in your company, Jonathan? Until recently I was sales manager. However, I've recently been promoted to regional manager. So I'll be in charge of running our new office. Can I ask where the office is located? Yes, of course. It's located downtown just around the corner from Royal Square Shopping Centre. Hmm, that's a bit too far out of the centre for my liking. I'd much prefer to be located in close proximity to the station. Do you have any property located in that vicinity? It would help me to narrow down the results if you could tell me how many employees you intend to have working in the office. Our branch is made up of 30 employees, and we'd like some extra space for meetings and presentations. Most average office spaces are around 8,000 square feet, but it sounds like you would need more space than that. I think that 10,000 square feet would be more suitable for your needs. Now, let's see, we have 10 properties that match those criteria, so let's try and narrow it down. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Do you have any other requirements? Well, we'll need access to the office 12 hours a day, but security should be 24 hour. We don't hold any money on the premises, but it's crucial that we protect our customer information against theft. OK, anything else? Yes, ideally I would prefer the new office to be split over two levels, so that the working office area is kept separate from street level. That will enable us to locate a reception at ground floor level to welcome customers when they arrive. And are there any particular facilities that you need? Our employees work very hard throughout the day, and I want to make sure that they're well nourished. It would therefore be ideal if I could provide them with a kitchen to cook hot meals at lunchtime. Would you want the kitchen to be located at first floor level with the office? No, I don't want the office to be filled with the smell of food. It would be better if the new office had a basement where we could locate the kitchen and staff room area to keep it at arm's length from the workspace. OK, I have now narrowed the search to two available properties. Do you have any other requirements that could narrow our search down to one result? All of our office staff will be working at desktop computers so I'll need the office to be equipped with at least 40 power sockets, if possible. Anything else? 
Studies have shown that exercise is very important for maintaining happiness and healthy brain function. In an office environment, it's very difficult to get sufficient daily exercise, so it would be great if they had access to a nearby exercise area. One of the available offices is located next door to a gym. Would this be suitable? Yes, absolutely. A gym is exactly what I was thinking of. Brilliant. Do you need the office to be furnished? I don't think so. I already have some furniture, so I would prefer to bring this myself. That's no problem at all. Ah, uh, and before I forget, we will definitely require Wi-Fi access, as much of our work and customer recruitment is carried out online. No problem. It sounds like the property will suit your needs perfectly. I've taken the liberty of booking you a viewing at 3pm on Thursday, so you can see it for yourself. Is there anything else I can help you with today? No, I think that's all the information I need. Thanks very much for your help. No problem. It's been my pleasure to be of assistance. Goodbye. Now is the end of part one, but now let's begin with part two. Center. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Hello everyone, my name is Sally. Welcome to our globally renowned spa and relaxation centre here at Island View Estates. Before you all wander off and begin exploring the facilities, I'd like to go over a few things. Now, this year is a very special milestone for our beloved centre, as it is our 25th anniversary. I understand that this means you have all paid an increased price for your tickets, but I can promise that all of the events we have scheduled for your enjoyment will make the costs well worth it. I know that all of you have travelled a long distance to make it here to the centre of the New Forest, but it is thanks to its remoteness that our centre is such a beautiful place to relax. I am sure you are all keen to find out what activities we have arranged for you, so I will give you a quick overview. Tomorrow we have arranged for you all to participate in a yoga session for the duration of the morning followed by a day of relaxation at the pool where we have ample sun umbrellas to protect you from the sun. On Wednesday we have organised a sightseeing hike through the forest where you will be able to test your navigation skills and witness the wild ponies in their natural habitat. It's forecast to be sunny that day but I recommend that you all bring rainproof clothes just in case. On your last day, we have a special surprise, a pony trek along the beach. We ask that you all wear full-length trousers and that all women have their hair tied up in a ponytail. Helmets are provided at the centre for those who would like to wear one. There are a couple of beautiful attractions here at the centre that you must all be sure to visit before you leave. The Rose Garden, located just at the corner of the property, is home to many indigenous species and is beautifully serene and peaceful, the perfect place to collect your thoughts or read a book. Our sunset boat ride has been the favourite attraction for many of our visitors. 
Simply hop aboard and relax whilst we sail you out into the open sea to witness one of the most beautiful spectacles that nature has to offer. Last, but certainly not least, is the freshwater pond, which serves as a watering hole of sorts. Some of you may even be lucky enough to spot our resident kingfishers, who are members of a very rare and endangered species. Once you have all unpacked and settled into your rooms, we will be taking you out to the neighbouring island for a bonfire and barbecue dinner. The island is very small and the bicycle trails make it very easy to explore all of its beautiful corners. As the island is entirely separate from the mainland, it has never been inhabited by wildlife, so you can all roam freely and safely. We have some bonding exercises for you all to take part in around the bonfire, where you can potentially make new friends and discover a lot about yourself. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you'll have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now let me tell you a little bit about the facilities that the resort has to offer. For those of you keen on indulging in a little bit of retail therapy, just wander along to our tourist centre where we have a wide selection of presents on sale at reasonable prices. If you are feeling more drawn to the natural surroundings and scenery, I recommend that you take a trek up the mountain where you can enjoy the panoramic outlook from the peak. For a bit of cultural indulgence, why not pay a visit to our small on-site theatre where you can enjoy watching a range of movies and check out some works by our resident street artists. Just a 10 minute walk down the road is the local art museum where you can roam around the sculpture courtyard or admire the many artworks on display. Here at the resort we are incredibly lucky to be located right next to a nature reserve where many species of endangered wildlife live in the pond. Just on the bank is a small hut where visitors can observe the fish and birds in their natural habitat. Now, if any of you are interested in history, you have the very interesting opportunity to visit the ancient building at the south side of the grounds. The building is now a museum, however, it originally served as a jail for those charged with crimes of treason against the royal family. Well, that just about rounds it up. Now, if anyone has any questions... Now is the end of part two, but now let's begin with part three. Me? two students talking about their book club. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi Tommy, I haven't seen you for ages. How have you been? 
Oh, hi, Lara. I'm great. I've just joined a local book club that meets every Wednesday, and I'm really enjoying it. Next week, we're discussing the novels of Charles Dickens. I'm really looking forward to it, as he's my favorite author. Yes, absolutely. His novels are wonderful. I attended Dickens Book Club, too. Would you like to do a practice session with me in preparation for your meeting? Sure, that sounds great. Let's start by discussing the main characters in David Copperfield and the ways in which they're affected by the events of the story as it develops. What do you think of Rosie? I think that she's a really sweet character in the beginning, but as the story progresses, she becomes bitter because of how her relationships had turned out in the past. That's true. Her sisters all marry and live happily ever after, but she ends up alone. It is very interesting to see how deeply the change in her personality affects her relationships. What is your opinion of Flory? I find her very manipulative. She seems intent on seeking attention, so whenever she wants something from her family members, she persistently acts in a very silly manner, just like a kid. Unfortunately, many people do not realize this, and so they give her the attention that she's seeking, which only encourages her to continue behaving this way. Yes, Flory is the complete opposite of Lizzie. Lizzie is very sensitive, and she has a true perceptiveness into how people are feeling and how they behave, which enables her to act appropriately towards them. She is very kind and generous and cares about how people feel. That's true, and I really like her character too. My least favorite character is Estelle, because she acts so selfishly and gets enjoyment from making others suffer. Unfortunately, there are many people like her in the world who intend to make others feel like this. It's interesting how you can associate so many of the characters with people that you know in real life. I think that the reason why Dickens is so good at creating deep and believable characters is because he understands human mentality. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you'll have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Absolutely. What do you think of the literature lectures? I really look forward to them. They're the highlight of my week. The lecturer is usually late, but that gives you time to settle down and get organized before the lecture begins. Do you have a discussion period at the end? No, I don't think so. We're meant to, but since the lectures often begin late, this means that there is no time left for a conversation about the lecture. I think this is a real shame, because it really helps you to gain a good understanding of the books when you hear other people's opinion of it. What about your lectures? My lecturers have very good organization skills, so their lectures are well organized and packed full of information. They always leave enough time at the end for consideration, when everyone is really quiet and we reflect on the lecture in our own minds before we open up for discussion. This really helps you to gather your thoughts and absorb the information from the lecture. Oh, that sounds brilliant. Do you think there is anything that needs to be improved? My experience of the course overall is really brilliant, but I feel there are many improvements that could be made to it. The IT support staff are great, but there are just not enough computers available for the numbers of people that need to use them. Every time that I need to use a computer, I have to queue up for at least 15 minutes. I find that the librarians are really helpful and approachable. However, the equipment is just not good enough. Whenever I need to use the photocopying facilities, for example, most of the machines are really old and slow, which means that you have to wait for ages for them to work. It's really frustrating because I'm often stretched for time. Perhaps we should start a petition to encourage the university to improve their facilities. That sounds good. What do you think of the group discussions? I really enjoy them. Since the class groups are so small, everyone gets to have their say and contribute thoughts to the conversation. So the classes are really effective. 
The only issue is that it's very difficult to find an opportunity to meet up, since everyone has such busy schedules. Yes, definitely. In our class, we pass around a ball, and only the person holding the ball is allowed to speak. Each person is only allowed to speak for a minute at a time, which helps us to make sure that we use the class time fairly, and it also makes the discussion more fun. That's true. It's been really great catching up with you. Thanks for your help. No problem. Good luck at your class. Bye. No is the end of part 3 but you have 30 seconds for check your answers now but after this part 4 will be start. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today we're going to delve into the fascinating history of music in Britain and the evolution that it experienced throughout the duration of the 18th and 19th centuries. During the second half of the 18th century, Britain experienced an industrial revolution during which its manufacturing industry underwent a major transition from hand production methods to the use of machinery. This sudden boom in the industry drew thousands of people into the cities, where they knew they'd be able to find jobs in the factories, working with or maintaining the machinery. This sudden influx of people into the cities did not just come from the surrounding countryside, but also from other poorer nations in search of a better life. Between 1800 and 1900, the population of England increased by four times. This mass immigration from different nations and areas of the country resulted in a variety of cultural influences meeting and mixing to form a new, more diverse culture. With this new culture came a new style of music. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, music had originally been written to reflect the hard, labour-intensive life in all kinds of industries when all work had to be done by hand. Most people resided in small, rural communities where their lives revolved around farming. Life for the average person was difficult, as incomes were meagre, and malnourishment and disease were common. Despite the difference in nationalities of the people and the variety of musical genres, all of the music shared one common language, English. As many were unable to write, the songs were a means for the people to give voice to their experiences and feelings about their hard and laborious jobs. Most of the music written by the workers during this period has been lost, as a result of illiteracy and the wear of time. Now, you may be asking yourselves how these small musical works were formed. The roots of most of these groups can mostly be traced back to the younger members of the working classes, who were perhaps rebelling against the inferiority of their living and working conditions compared to those of the upper classes. Young performers would often lead these musical trends, usually possessing a great talent for singing or playing particular handmade instruments. As time progressed into the 19th century, these musical groups had gained much notoriety and would hold small performances in the street for all to watch. It was perhaps their blind optimism and rebellious spirit that led them to become so popular with their audiences, which were usually made up of the poorest of the poor. Despite efforts by the upper classes to put an end to these musical traditions, they continued to gain popularity and flourish. By the late 1870s, they had evolved past the barrier of the social echelons and gained access to the middle class. Performances were held in proper establishments, such as village halls, and some were even ticketed, with audiences paying a fee for the privilege of watching. Music produced by these groups were better recorded, and some is still preserved today in museums. The music of these groups may not exist in the present day, but its influences are still clear if you look closely enough. In classical culture, for example, many of the themes and theatrical performances are still based on the lives and experiences of the working classes both prior to and following the Industrial Revolution. 
The novel entitled Les Miserables by Victor Hugo, for example, is a novel about the French working classes and is still widely popular today. The original recordings of the music written during these periods are now hugely valuable due to the demand from avid collectors and enthusiastic fans. Many of these recordings are publicly owned and displayed in museum exhibits. However, a selection are still privately owned and occasionally appear for sale in auctions, often reaching prices in the hundreds of thousands. Well, that just about wraps the lecture up for today. So, if anyone has any questions... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.